Are we good to roll whenever? We can start whenever? Yep. That's right, cool. cool. Then we can just... Sahil Bloom, thank you so much for coming on the very first inaugural episode of the 15-minute founder. The goal is we're going to try to put Sahil Bloom in a 15-minute episode. I got to talk on like 2x, 3x speed. I normally <laughs> talk pretty fast, but I'll try to go even faster for you so that we can jam it all in there. ton of stuff I want to cover, but right. what I'm thinking about is why don't we just take it from your story, starting from there, getting to where you are today, and then actually thinking about the future. The very first thing I wanted to ask was, if you do the math, for an individual to get to where they are today, there's their parents, and then their parents' parents and their parents' parents' parents. And if you do the math, it's about 4,000 ancestors, depending how many levels back you go to get to where you are today. But tell me about your story, how you exist today, and what you think about doing in terms of the ancestors in front of you too. Uh, I love that. So, I mean, I come from a mixed race background. My mom is Indian, grew up in India and Bangalore. And my dad is a white Jewish guy born and raised in the Bronx um, right here. So my family and like my whole sort of upbringing was this like collision of two worlds. You know, I think the, like, the, the actual important part of how that manifested itself for me was just that I never really felt like I fit into a single bucket and that was really challenging growing up you know when you're a kid you just want to fit in like desperately desperately want to fit in and then as you get older you sort of desperately want to stand out and be different and figure out how you're unique in the world but when you're a kid you really just want to fit into a bucket that's like your common desire and common thread among children and so that was really challenging for me because I didn't know if I was like the nerdy Indian kid that was going to go be a doctor or was I the like jock athlete type and like wanted to you know, go pursue that. And I was pretty good at sports. I was also pretty good at school and trying to figure out my lane and figure out where I fit in was really tough. And I didn't really fit in anywhere perfectly. And so like a lot of my childhood years, I felt like I had sort of an internal struggle around that of just defining myself and figuring out what my identity was. I did end up going playing baseball in college, um, played at Stanford from 2009 to 2013, had a great experience, hurt my shoulder, unfortunately, which derailed my professional aspirations. Probably a good thing because I don't think I would have uh, really made a living out of it, but it was tough nonetheless. And again, like the point on identity and kind of having your identity stripped away from you is always a really painful thing. Ended up working in finance for the first seven years of my career at a private equity fund. Had a great experience, but I didn't want to do leverage buyouts for the rest of my life. Honestly, just had the belief that like if I was going to spend my one life doing something, I didn't want it to be that. I just wasn't going to nerd out on it and be excited enough about it to do that for my entire career. And then COVID happened. And for me, like a lot of people, that kind of provided me the opportunity to actually take a step back and think about what I wanted to do and what I was really good at, find my sort of quote unquote zone of genius and what I thought I could actually maybe be the best in the world at. Uh, and that was when I started writing, you know, fast forward to today. And that's kind of turned into this whole ecosystem of things, both from a content platform standpoint, and then also all these businesses that have kind of been built around and alongside all of it. So I, I'm personally just very grateful for the whole journey, but uh, certainly a winding path to get to where we are today. The other thing you mentioned, which I wanted to ask is I hear time and time again, but a lot of people who are in finance and maybe feel like, hey, this isn't for me or I want to do something else. It sounds like COVID was a time when you realized you want to be working on the right thing. Do you have a framework or how do you decide that you're working on the right things that matter or the big things that matter? Even today when you're thinking forward, how do you really focus your time or even think, am I working on the right thing at this moment? There's this question that I think it was Tim Ferriss kind of made it more popular, but it was originally from Newt Gingrich, the American politician, which is super random. But basically to just ask yourself, am I hunting antelope or field mice? The question is an interesting one. What it means is antelope are kind of the big things. Those are the things that really, really, really matter, the important things. And then field mice are these tiny little things that aren't really going to satiate your hunger in any meaningful way, but you're going to have to chase them around and run around a whole lot at them. And the field mice are really hard to catch because they're tiny and they're running around in tons of different directions. And so the whole point is that you should want to spend your time hunting antelope antelope and not field mice. But actually taking a step back to identify what are you hunting at this point in time is something that most people don't take the time to do. You you chase field mice around, you know, emails, random notifications, all the like small little urgent things that pop up during the course of, course of your day. Those are all field mice when you should be chasing the antelope, which is the one big thing that truly moves the needle, the priority, the thing that actually moves you forward in your business, in your life, in your personal, in your relationships, your health, whatever it is. And so for me now, in sort of any endeavor that I'm taking on and in any domain within my life, I'm asking myself that question. Am I hunting antelope or field mice? And how do I make sure that I continue to hunt the one antelope that really matters all on that way? What is it that truly drives you now? And to, to give a framework or a few options, and you can add an option here, would you say it's money, fame, <laughs> power, pleasure, you're gonna hit all me with the, the above four or idols. None of the above? Um, so I, th I mean, what you're referencing is um, St. Thomas Aquinas has this model of the four idols, which are money, power, pleasure, and fame, or the four idols that he talked about. And effectively, what it's arguing is that 
we all have one idol that is actually the fundamental one that we are chasing. And we all think that we'll, by chasing it, we're going to eventually attain it and we're going to be happy. And the reality is that you can chase it your whole life and you're never actually going to derive happiness from going and achieving it. You're just going to continue to want to chase. The goalposts are just going to change. And so the whole point of the exercise is figuring out which one is your idol, which one are you chasing, and acknowledging that it's not going to fundamentally make you happy by going and achieving it. So actually the way to do it is you reverse engineer. You go through those four and you say which one do I definitely not care about and you eliminate and kind of back into the one that's yours I mean for me the ones I eliminate very quickly um, pleasure I don't particularly care about like feeling good at a given moment I all the time do things that are challenging and don't feel great because I don't care much about pleasure I care about the long term that I'm that I'm building um, I definitely eliminate power next um you know i'm not like particularly motivated by like running a company with 100 people don't really care about having power and then for me it's between money and fame and i eliminate money in that context just because i sort of feel like i have enough i'm not searching for like 200 million dollars you could offer to pay me 200 million dollars to work 80 hours a week for the next five years and i would say no so for me i guess like my idol would be fame and i'm not embarrassed to acknowledge that i think it's like you know, we're all motivated by something. And what it means to me is that I need to make sure that I'm not chasing that as a means to happiness and that I'm actually deriving happiness from the process of what I'm doing on a daily basis and the actions and the habits and the things that I'm going through on a daily basis, rather than that prize of thinking that you're going to wake up one day and achieve that and be happy. How do you do that? I mean, even just using the example of money where you could potentially set a number or a line and say, if I hit this, I'll be happy. Yeah. Oftentimes that happens and you don't. You just set your goals yeah. on the next thing. With fame, how are you telling yourself, hey, it's not going to be X million followers or it's not going to be you know, this many connections on LinkedIn, whatever it might be. How do you, <laughs> Definitely how do you, not just, that. <laughs> how do you in practice tell yourself, hey, I'm going to do the process versus having these goals. And I'm sure you do have goals within yeah. the fame equation or the fame <clears throat> pursuit too. I mean, it's just about enjoying and finding fulfillment in what you actually are doing, the actual habits that are building towards that end. So if the end is the thing that you think you want, you're going to be disappointed because you're going to get there and realize that it's just a mirage. It just disappears and reappears out on the horizon. But if you're actually enjoying the process to get to that end, that's a totally different story. I mean, the friend of mine, Alex Hormozzi, who's, um, I was talking to him recently about this because he's very driven by money. He talks a lot about money. And at least from the outside looking in, that's what I perceived it as. And and I asked him about it and he was like, no, I actually don't care about the money. I love the game. Like, I really love the game of trying to figure out how to make more money and how I'm doing it better than I was yesterday and get improving at that general process of making money. It's not about the number. And that really resonated for me. Like for me, the, the fame thing is like you're getting more and more followers. The like video game scoreboard is sort of going up. But the fun is figuring out okay, what worked there, like distilling it, deconstructing what's working, what's not, figuring out the creative process of how to create more of that. Um, that is the real enjoyment that I get today. And what I really try to focus on is that. Because if you focus on, you know, like I'm about to cross a million followers on Twitter. If I focus on that, I'm not going to feel any, di like it'll feel cool when I see the number. I'll be like, oh, that's neat, really cool. Like a lot of hard work went into that. I'll feel good for maybe like 10 minutes. And then I know I'm not going to feel any different. It's not like I'm going to wake up and be a different person or something like that and feel like my whole life has changed the same exact shit as the day before and so it's a really dangerous game when you think that your happiness is going to all of a sudden come and materialize from whatever the number is what traits do you think are the most important or the overlap you see in top performers yeah <clears throat> i mean people who understand the difference between motivation and discipline uh definitely have a tendency to succeed like when you think about people that just are able to ground themselves in discipline to do things that they don't necessarily want to do on a daily basis those people tend to win over the long run because if you if you rely on motivation there are going to be a whole hell of a lot of days where you just don't want to do the thing i mean i I, probably like 80% of days I don't want to wake I wake up at 4 30 like I don't want to do that 80% of days it's not like I wake up and I'm like all chipper and excited to get out of bed sometimes I have something that I'm really excited to work on but for the most part you have to ground yourself in something that's just like daily getting up meat and potatoes like punching the clock to go and do the thing and that's what you know, Chris Paul calls it stacking days and I think that's such a powerful way of thinking about it it's like I'm just going to stack days and they're not all going to be sexy or pretty or whatever it is but I'm just going to show up and I know that on the other side of stacking a bunch of days is going to be a win in some way. I'm going to have made progress at it. So if you can just stack days over and over and over again, good things happen. Um, you know, and then the other one for me is like Charles Darwin said, it's not the strength.
strongest or the most intelligent species that survives, it's the one that's most adaptable to change. And I think about that all the time, just adaptability as a key, key factor in your ability to survive and thrive across long periods of time. Because the reality is, it's Mike Tyson said it best, like, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that is so true. You set out, you can create this like beautiful strategy document of what you're going to do in your life or at your business or whatever and you start down the path and it sounds great and then all of a sudden wham you get smoked and it's how you actually react to that how are you adapting how are you going in a different direction to actually continue to win and if you can't if you're not adaptable to change that's it you get cut off and it's done and you go start back at the starting line or whatever end up happening happening so being anti-fragile being able to actually benefit from that chaos being adaptable i think is just the most critical thing for people to understand and in order to really thrive. But what's something that you strongly believe in that the majority of people would actually disagree with you on? It could be on mm. human nature or maybe it's something you've realized and you've gone through throughout your personal journey. Now that people sort of see where you are and see the journey you've taken, something that they just don't get about actually the process that you've taken to get here. I really, really believe that if anyone comes to me and says, hey, I'm not happy with where I am in my life and I want to you know, make positive changes, the first thing I would tell them to do is wake up at five in the morning and go and work out for an hour. And if you can do that for a week, I seriously think you will start to change your life. And the reason I say that is just because there's no losers that wake up at five in the morning and work out. You just can't do it. Like you can, you can stay up late and work out at night, like do all sorts of things, but really like no one does unproductive things early in the morning because it's just so much easier to, to stay in bed. You would just sleep. No one gets up at five in the morning and watches Netflix. You don't do it because you'd rather sleep. And so you stay asleep. So if you can be the type of person that gets up and goes and works out, you start to identify as a winner very, very quickly. I really think it would take a week. Like if you're not happy with where you are in life and you do that for a week, I really think after a week you would start to be like, oh, holy shit. You would start to rewire your brain as someone who is a winner and that does what they say they're going to do. And that has ripple effects that extend to everywhere else in your life. You start eating better because you're working out. You start sleeping better because you're tired. You start focusing better because you're sleeping better at night. The endorphins are hitting you. You're starting to feel happier about yourself. You start to feel confident in yourself because you're doing that. For me, that really would be the most powerful thing I would say. Like if anyone came to me and asked me for advice, that would be the first thing I would say. 100% agree. I think I often think about that too in terms of sharpening your body to sharpen your mind. And it doesn't quite literally mean, you know, yeah. getting shredded or quite literally yeah. sharpening your body. And I don't like even care. I mean, you could go walk for 30 minutes. Like, I don't think you need to be going and doing like a Barry's boot camp, hit workout, you know, like fancy shit, you know, fancy equipment, deadlifting 400 pounds. Like, go outside for 30 minutes and go for a walk or just do something. But like, you get out of bed, you did the thing you said you were going to do, and then you're go do whatever you want after that. I'm pretty sure you're going to make good decisions after you do that in the morning. Yeah. As you're saying it too, I'm thinking at 5 a.m., has anyone ever sent a text that they regretted sending. Has anyone ever binged and Maybe if they the stayed diet? up until 5, <laughs> no, not waking True, okay. up at 5. If they're out in, yeah. out in, out yeah. in Brooklyn Mirage until no. 5 and whatever, but no. have you ever binged and ruined a diet at 5 a.m.? No. Probably not. Have you ever sent a, a work email to someone you've regretted at 5 a.m.? Probably not. Yeah. No, yeah, you, no one's many... awake. There's literally, you have to be in your own head. It's um, Blaise Pascal. Uh, I think it was in the 1600s, Blaise Pascal said, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit alone in a room. Facts. And that is just true. It's just true. We've lost our ability to be bored. We've lost the ability in this day and age. And he said that in 1600, by the way. So Humans he was haven't changed identifying much. it as a problem then. Now imagine, <laughs> now we have a million apps on our phones. We have all these things that are competing for our attention. And those things generally accelerate during the course of the day. There's more emails, there's more text, there's more social media notifications after noon than there are before noon. So if you can get up and like break the wiring, you're like throwing a freaking wrench in the spoke of that craziness wheel and you can have time to yourself to actually go focus on things that matter to spend time on yourself to identify as a winner i just think it has massive massive ripple effects into your whole life not many people if you actually zoom out actually do something for a week let alone stack the days to 30 60 but what i'd love to ask you is what is your morning routine and how does environment if at all shape into the routine you have in the morning so that you can maintain the discipline there or mm -hmm. hey are you just hyper hyper motivated and you know willpower is a muscle that you've built and that's how you're able to sustain it um I wake, I, my morning routine is pretty simple. I wake up at 4.30, I get in the cold plunge for three to five minutes, uh, go downstairs and have my uh, little morning cocktail, athletic greens and um, element salt electrolytes. I go get a coffee, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, and then I go to my desk. And I'm basically at my desk working on 
the antelope, hunting the antelope, whatever it is. Usually it's some writing project, something that I need to work on, newsletters, book, etc. cetera, um, from 5 to 7.30. And I just have like a very focused, quiet block of work time for that first two and a half hours of the day. It's before my son wakes up, before my wife's up. Um, I can really focus. There's no emails coming in. I'm not looking at email. Like I'm really locked in on that one thing. And that sets the tone for my entire day. To like get up, got the energy boost from getting in the cold plunge, did the hard thing to start the day, and then hit the ground running. Um, on your question on environment, I mean, environment's everything. And environment is not just the physical space around you, it's the people, it's the digital environment around you. Like if you change your environment, you change your life. If you're in a bad spot in life, you have to go and evaluate what environment are you living in? Who are the people that you're allowing to surround your surround your world? The ideas that are you know being pushed into you by the content you're consuming, all of that is part of your environment. And if you change that, you can completely change where you are and your whole perspectives and the things that you're operating around. If you get around friends who are consistently talking about parties that they went to in the past, you know, binge drinking nights, um, you know, talking shit about a bunch of stuff from the past. And all of a sudden you flip from being there to being with a group of friends who's talking about building businesses in the future, to who are talking about investing in their health, mental and physical, or we're talking about deep, meaningful relationships with people they care about. Where do you think you're better off? Where do you think you're going to be in a better spot for the life that you want to live and build? That might be fun, the former, for like a couple of years when you're young, early in your life, college days, whatever. But where do you want to live? Where do you want to live your life? And so for people that want to change, you got to change your whole environment. Get into a place where you can make good decisions easily. That's the whole thing. It's like James Clear talks about it in Atomic Habits. Remove the friction from these decisions. If you want to get up early, put your phone in your bathroom so that when the alarm goes off, you have to get up out of bed to go to turn it off because then you're not going to get back into bed once you're up and you're walking around on the floor you might if it's right next to you and you can just press the snooze by reaching over that that's actually much much easier if you want to eat healthy what's in your fridge when you open it up does it look like healthy foods so that's i mean that is a really really big one for most people is just make your environment match your goals and what you're actually trying to go out and achieve did you literally break up with friends did you have conversations or was that just a transition you said you decided you were going to make and you kind of attracted the right people around you or putting yourself out there with that energy as wishy-washy woosah as that sounds attracted people that you wanted to spend more time with i mean you you can break up with people with your actions not with your words if you're trying to change your life and you're trying to you know make those positive changes get up earlier start going to the gym start eating healthier not drinking as much all of these things that you're trying to change if you just start doing them the people that aren't conducive to those changes are going to fall by the wayside in your life and they're going to fall back and fall out of your life because they're not going to want to hang around you like they don't want to hang around with the guy that's not fun because he's going to bed early or he's not drinking whatever and if you're trying to make those changes that's great and it's a much easier way than having to have the conversation and say like, hey, I'm breaking up with you as a friend. So you can walk away from people with your actions. Similarly, there are going to be people that walk away from you with their actions and we need to stop trying to chase them. Like, I have tons of friends who have spent years trying to chase their like hometown friends and stay in touch and do all these things when those people were clearly running in a different direction with their actions and behaviors. I think in general, we just need to be OK with the fact that there are people that are only suited for single seasons of your life or for for a few seasons of your life. There's nothing wrong with that. You can be like a hermit crab and sort of like leave your shell and go to the next one and find a new shell that's better suited for this next phase of your life. There's nothing wrong with that. I think the desire to actually cling on to people from prior seasons of your existence that no longer match what you're trying to do is actually a source of a whole lot of pain and suffering for a lot of people. But I'm gonna also guess that you're not perfect like anyone else. So even just taking the routine you described, how do you personally get out of a rut? Like, let's say you've skipped a few days in a row or you're feeling just down, like you've missed the morning workouts. And I believe, agree with you, whatever that keystone habit is, whether it's exercise, whether it's the meditation, whether it's quality family time, if you miss that, technically things can spiral. How do you get out of those ruts when yeah, they happen? I fall in ruts all the time. Um, Warren Buffett has this quote, the first thing to do when you find yourself at the bottom of a hole is stop digging. And stop digging usually means rest. And it usually means you need to figure out what is the rest that I actually need right now and to find it in a meaningful way. There's this whole idea that there are different types of rest. There's like spiritual rest, there's physical rest, there's all these different types, seven types of rest, I think is the framework for it. And you need to figure out what that rest is that you need and actually go and make sure 
that you are getting it. Because if you don't, what ends up happening is that you blow up and then you have like a month where you're just completely cratered and you're not able to get any of the things done that you need. The whole point is that we need to stay in the game. You know, when you talk about stacking days, it's like all of this, all of this positive compounding stuff that we're talking about is all about anything above zero compounds positively. And the whole goal with compounding is that you never let it stop. You just continue to have it drive in a positive direction. When you fall out of the game because you weren't willing to rest a little bit and then you're out for a month, that really stops the compounding from continuing. So if you can actually avoid that by getting the rest you need before it becomes this massive blow up, that's a meaningful advantage. You're allowing yourself to stay in the game over longer periods of time. Those are the people that ultimately will win, the people that can just stay in the game. Good days and bad days, just make sure you're staying in the game. Everyone says there's no shortcuts, you have to work hard. I actually, I actually think that working hard is incredibly risky because I think one of the biggest forms of self-protection people take is hedging, where they say, I'm not gonna give it my all, and then if it fails, I can look back and say, I didn't give it my all. How do you know when you're working hard on the right thing and it's worth it, or it's not worth it? Um, Tim Ferriss had this question, what would this look like if it were easy, that I constantly try to ask myself today, because my natural wiring is to be a grinder. I wanna just like put my head down and grind at things and really push, and I take pride and embrace doing the hard thing and continuing to do it the hard way, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, if you will. And that's good most of the time until it's not. And it's not if you're doing something hard just for the sake of it being hard. And there's actually a higher leverage, more efficient way to do it that would unlock you to go spend time on other things, other things that matter. And so for me, in, in this like time of my life that I'm in, this season of my life, the other thing might be spending time with my son, spending time with my wife, like the most important thing in my world. And so if I'm doing something hard and it's taking me two hours because I'm doing it on hard mode, but there's actually an easy mode that it would take five minutes to do or 10 minutes to do, me not thinking about that and not identifying that easy mode way to play the game is really dumb because I'm just taking time away from the things that really, really matter in my life. And so asking yourself that question, what would this look like if it were easy? Is there a higher leverage, more efficient way to do this that I can pursue that will allow me to just unlock and then redeploy more efficiently into other things that I really want to spend time on is a really meaningful pursuit that more people need to be spending time on. And I think the key thing here is actually making time to pause and reflect and zoom yeah. out. Yeah, you have to, you, have to, um, you have to search for gold before you can dig for gold. Like you can't just start digging in one spot and assume there's going to be gold there you have to like go and scan the entire map and go actually find where the gold is and then you can go dig deeper on the gold there and figure out the highest leverage way to get the gold up from wherever it is but you can't just go just start digging and hope that you're going to find the stuff that's like a recipe for absolute disaster your whole life yeah everyone in some sense is figuring out as they go yeah yeah i totally agree with and you need to create a bunch in order to find the stuff that is the gold it's like shots on gold you need to take a bunch of shots in order to figure out what it is. That's why I also think working hard in your 20s is really important because that's when you can take a bunch of shots with minimal risk. Like you in general in your 20s don't have a family yet to take care of, you know, kids, like your risk profile is much higher and so you can take a bunch of different shots and if they all screw up, that's okay. Like you're not leaving someone hanging, you probably don't have a mortgage yet. You know, there's a whole lot of um, risk capacity in your life at that point. Another question I want to ask you, and this can be looking back at previous decades of your life and mm -hmm. where you are now, what would you say is the biggest piece of relationship advice you would have? That could be for someone who's either, someone who is single looking to find that one or someone who's in a relationship too. What's the biggest thing you've learned or the biggest advice you'd have for someone in going through that? Life is mostly just sitting around doing nothing. So find someone that you're going to be really, really excited to do nothing with. There's this tendency to think that life is all about the glamorous Instagram moments. Like we see them on everyone's highlight reels, all the vacations, the beautiful dinners, these like sexy moments of your life. And the reality is that is a tiny fraction of what your actual life is going to look like as you settle down with a person. The vast majority of your time is going to be spent watching TV together, sitting around at home, taking care of kids doing the things that are like moments of nothing. And so when you find someone that you are really excited to just do nothing with, that's your person that you really want to be around. Thanks a ton. Awesome, Is there any, any final thing that I didn't no. ask you that you want to share with people? No, this was great. Really enjoyed it and excited to see where you take this. Awesome. I right, well, thanks a ton, man. This is a ton Absolutely. of fun. Absolutely. Sweet.